Hi everybody, welcome back. So I just got back from a week's vacation with the family and uh, it was a lot of fun. Went out to the beach, got to do some fun things, got majorly rained on. We had some big storms with it we had to dodge but that actually just made it more fun for us. So anyway, it's good to be back and uh, before we get back to the busy hustle bustle of work, I'm going to take this opportunity of the last bit of my vacation time now that I'm home to do the what I'm going to call the final video for now at least on this CTF 1250. The reason I say that is that if I complete this or not this will be the last video at least for a while on this because I have so many other projects that I'm really excited to do. I really want to get them done or at least get on to them. And I know some of you, or maybe most of you, are just getting tired of seeing this thing uh, in video after video. Although it's been a lot of fun, and I've enjoyed it, and I've learned a whole lot along the way, so uh, it's pretty good. Anyway, what we're going to do on this last video is I'm going to talk about one thing first, and then after we do that, I'm going to complete the alignment, or at least hopefully complete the alignment, on the record playback equalization as well as the alignment of the record circuit and the Dolby circuit at which point it should be working pretty well. I did play a couple of tapes. I don't have any really really good quality cassettes. I have boxes of them somewhere in a storage unit but as of right now I have not really tried to dig and find them and even if I did they're all you know, it's all copyrighted material, so we wouldn't even be able to play it anyway. But maybe what we will try is after we're done, we'll make a recording on this and play it back in directly into the recorder, into the camera, uh, through the through our buffer amp and the line outs and so forth. And just kind of get an idea of how it works. I mean, obviously it's still a recording that you're playing back on YouTube, but we'll see. So if that sounds interesting, stay tuned and that'll be this video and then I promise on the next video we're going to get into something different. So here's the thing I wanted to talk about first. This has been the source of, of great amounts of discussion, which is awesome, uh, on these videos. Uh, many people have suggested instead of using an alignment tape, why can't we use one of these things? And in case you don't know what this is, this is a little contraption that came out oh probably 30 or 35 years ago or better um, and all it is is a tape head just a normal tape head out of a cassette deck it's a very low quality <laughs> cheapy one in this one and they mount it in a cassette and they put some little gears in here to make the the two wheels turns to fake out your cassette deck to make it think that there's a, an actual tape in there rotating so it doesn't think it ate the tape or came to the end of the tape and they connect the output of the tape head to a coax wire and a little plug and this is supposed to plug into uh, your for instance your iPod or your your mp3 player or where in this in modern times your your mobile phone anything that has a headphone jack like this this is kind of use the headphone output that headphone output will modulate this little tape head so it's kind of a reverse tape head think of this as working like a record head would work and it magnetically couples to the playback head inside your tape deck so long story short this lets you play your digital music device through your cassette deck. This was important a long time ago because there was no Bluetooth and most car radios, mainly car stereos and so forth, did not have an auxiliary input. So what this allowed you to do is you pop this in your cassette deck. I'll give you an idea. So, for instance, if you had one of these, this is like a car radio type thing with a cassette that does not have an auxiliary input, unless it's the modified one that I have. And you would stick this in just like a normal cassette. The little wire would stick out, you know, just kind of pop it in there. And essentially what would happen is it would play 
you would plug this into your MP3 player through the headphone jack and you could play your music through the cassette deck. So this leads one to say why in the heck are you spending all kinds of crazy money on these uh, pre-recorded test tapes from GenLab and from other sources that cost a lot of money and the tapes wear out and all these other things and yada yada yada. Why would you do that when you could just connect this to your signal generator and play whatever signal you want into the, into the cassette deck? Well, there's several reasons and that's what we're going to talk about real quickly. Number one, if you recall from previous episodes of this series, we, come, we came to find out that a cassette, just like a vinyl record, like an LP, has pre-emphasis and de-emphasis, meaning that they're actually boosting certain frequencies and reducing other frequencies uh, so that the cassette can properly hold the information. Then when you play it back, they undo that. <laughs> and what this does is this reduces the amount of background noise. It also makes it have a more flat response curve. Okay, So without that equalization, this won't put that equalization on it because really all this is is a wire connected to a tape head. So you're just modulating that magnetic tape head directly. So it's not going to boost and cut the different frequencies that it needs to to make it respond to the different frequency ranges properly. So there's no pre-emphasis. So that's number one. Number two, this is a cheap plastic cassette. Okay, So we don't know how properly aligned this, this head is. In other words, this would have to be exactly precision aligned to the cassette so that when you adjust the azimuth and so forth, it would be tracking at the proper dimensions. Okay, So whenever they record these test tapes, where the head is placed with respect to the tape, it's actually set to a standard. In other words, that azimuth <laughs> is very critically aligned on the recording device that they use to make those test tapes. And every adjustment you do is going to be based on that. Without knowing how precision aligned this is, you may set the azimuth to this and it's non-standard to a cassette and it's going to, all your alignments are going to be off. <laughs> Won't work. So that's another big problem with this. Now you could say we could make one of these cassettes out of a machined aluminum or metal piece that's rigid and you could very critically align that and that would take care of that problem. But in that instance you would also need the proper uh, signal generator. Remember this tape head has a uh, an inductive and capacitive reactants, but it's mainly inductive reactants. Let's look at that. I have the LCR meter set up to, to measure inductance, and if we touch two pins here, because this is two channels, you can see this is about 106 millihenries. Okay, and if I go to these two, 109 millihenries, and if I go to these two, 211, which is essentially the two coils in, in series. So you can see this is an inductor, and different cassette heads have different inductance. In other words, if I measure the one, well, let me go over here and get across one of the heads, uh, one of the playback heads in this Pioneer. And you can see it's 156 millihenries. So it's a different inductance. And this will pose a completely different impedance curve to this one. Okay? They're all different. And the equalization to each of them then would also be different, if that makes sense. So you would have to pick a very specific head type 
and then you would have to build a very specific signal generator to pair up with this that would create the proper pre-emphasis and de-emphasis and take into consideration the impedance curve of this head to make sure <laughs> that it outputs the proper energy level for what you're trying to uh, align. If not, if you don't do that, your record level indicators and your playback level indicators will not be correct. So you can't align it properly. It won't work no matter what you do. So yes, you could probably do that. <laughs> but then you would have a signal generator tethered to this. You wouldn't be able to use any other signal generator than the one created specifically for this head and this setup. So you could see how rapidly this would get to be an exorbitantly expensive and complex piece of test equipment. Then to make matters worse, the distance between this head and the head that you're playing into would also affect the energy level because of the inverse square law. So the further away this, this uh, electromagnetic signal gets from the playback head, the weaker the signal will be to the playback head. So that would have to be a very fixed thing because remember, when I play the tape, the tape actually makes physical contact with the head. It eliminates any of that spacing error. So all of those things come into play and say, this will not work. Now you might say, well, but yeah, but I can play my, my MP3 player through this. Well, you can, but I can promise you it will not sound accurate. There's no possible way it can sound accurate. So yes, the sound may come through there. Yes, you may be able to adjust your bass and treble to get it reasonably good enough, but it is certainly not something that you would able, be able to do a critical alignment of a tape deck with. So I hope that explains why you cannot use this. Uh, I think it was worth the 10 minutes to explain this to you guys uh, so that you understand why we can't do it. All right, let's get on with the alignment. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is the bias adjustment. And you have to do the bias, there is a separate bias procedure for standard metal chrome and ferrochrome tapes. Unfortunately, I only have a standard tape and a chrome tape. So we're just going to do those two. <laughs> uh, but the procedure is the same for all of them. First thing they have you do is, if you look down here, there's a little standoff circuit board right here, these two circuit boards. And there are four pots. Each one of those, so you have left channel and right channel, and it, it represents metal, standard, chrome, and ferrochrome tapes. So what they want you to do for each of these is they want you to take these pots and adjust them to their center point. Now, of course, that's going to throw off all your levels, but we don't care about that right now. They just want this in the center point uh, of, it, of the record level adjustment. The next thing they want you to do is to go up to your signal generator. And I don't know if you can see it or not with the glare, but they want you to set up a 2 kilohertz signal and it's, I'm going to be at high impedance here, at 316 millivolts RMS, which represents a minus 10 dB input. And that minus 10 dB dBV input should then read out about minus 14.5 dB on your meter. And you can see we're there right now. And you're going to adjust that by adjusting the record level. And to, just to be sure, that also represents 188 millivolts on your millivolt meter. And if you notice the output going into the millivolt meter, is just coming out of the play out RCA jacks on the back of the tape deck. And I have it ter still terminated at that 50K termination. And you can see both channels are pretty close. That's as close as you're going to get it. Because if you move that in the tiniest little bit, it, it just has to be roughly in there, as close as possible. That one millivolt isn't going to make a difference. Now, because we went and centered those record level adjustments, we have no idea what these are going to peak out at. Um, 
because we centered those pots. But all they care about is they want us to go to the bias adjust, which is eight more pots. <laughs> and you can see right channel and left channel. And you can see you have the standard metal, chrome, and ferrochrome. And same thing over here, standard metal, chrome, ferrochrome. We're going to work with standard tape because we're starting out with a standard tape. And we're going to adjust these for a peak. So what you're going to see is the meter is going to peak and then drop. And that's what they want. Right at that drop, that's where they want you to set it. Again, because those pots are centered and they're, they're just at an arbitrary setting, the record level ones, these may not match. And we don't care about that right now. We know that the input signal matches because we carefully set that. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so we're going to start recording and we're going to go to, we're going to monitor the tape. And you can see the levels don't match and that's fine. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to peak these. So I'm going to go to the first channel and you can see when I turn it, it drops way down. So we're on the right channel right now. And as I adjust it, it's going to peak out and then it's going to, I'm going to go through the peak and it's going to start to drop again. See that? Right at that little drop point is where we want to leave it. Then we're going to go to the other channel and do the same thing. We're going to adjust that for a peak and then a drop. See it drops. So we're going to go up, peak it out once again and get it to that little drop point right there and we're just about there right there and that's it they're set and that's the bias adjustment for the normal cassette and I'm just using my TDK uh, what is it a D60 I, IEC1 type 1 I don't know you can look at it uh, for whatever it is, for what it's worth. That's the tape I have, so that's the one we're using. Uh, Pioneer had a very specific normal tape formulation. I heard that this is pretty close to it, uh, just from, from comments from some other uh, viewers and so forth, but uh, hopefully this will work. Okay, I do not have a type 4 metal tape. I only have a type 2 chrome tape, so that's what we're going to do. And it's not ideal because it's a 100 minute tape. I would much prefer a 60 or 90 minute tape. I think the 100 minute tapes might be a little bit thinner. But again, this is all I have. It's a brand new tape. I just unwrapped it. Um, here's what it is. It's a Maxell XL2. There you go. So that's what I have. That's what we're going to use. Once again, we're going to go over to here. And for this one, they want us to center VR1202. And VR1202 is the potentiometer right up from it. So the, this would be VR1202. So we're going to have to center these pots. And you can see it's almost completely turned off right now. You see that? So we're going to come around here and just kind of center it. Same thing here. That's close. Again, they're not perfect. We just, this is arbitrarily <laughs> centering it. And we're going to do the same process now. We're going to go over, we're going to start recording and we're going to adjust for that peak and this time we're going to adjust these ones that somebody already marked with a little red adjustment which tells me somebody's already been in here before me playing with it. You see the little red marks they put on that? Hopefully I'm focused, I don't know. But anyway, let's get it going. So I'll hit the record. I set it to chrome. Hit the record. And once again, we're going to adjust for a peak. So, and you can see there's the right channel. And that one was pretty much spot on. And I'll bet you this one's going to be as well. Yep. 
there. Okay. Okay, we're now going to do the record and playback frequency response adjustment. And to do that, we're going to feed a 333 hertz signal at 31.6 millivolts into the input, record input, okay? And I did verify with the meter that that is in fact what's going into the record jacks. <laughs> these are tiny signals. You're then going to adjust these and because these two potentiometers are not perfectly tracking when you're dealing with one millivolt increments, you have to kind of fiddle with each one individually and it's very, very hard because there's a lot of friction between them. But this is about as close as I could get and it'll bounce around one millivolt or so and they want you to have 18.8 .8 millivolts roughly. Again, we're talking about splitting hairs here. So we got that all set. And again, what we're going to do is we're going to recreate <laughs> that record, uh, the pre-emphasis. That's why you're going to see different levels uh, fed in here. We're going to go back to our standard tape and we put our standard tape back in there. Okay, now that we have that set, we're going to go to tape. We're going to start recording. And you're not going to see a whole lot here because you're such a tiny signal. But if we go up here, and remember the channels are not matched because we have those two pots still set to the center. Uh, roughly in the center, so we don't really care if they match, we just care what they are. So if you look right now, at 333 hertz, we're at 44.8 millivolts and 29.8 millivolts. Okay, so we're going to write that down. So we want <clears throat> 44, so we're just going to say 44.6, we'll say, and 29.8. Okay. Now, without changing anything else, we're just going to change the frequency. And we're going to move it from 333 hertz to 10 kilohertz. And the name of the game here, you see it's going to change. And you see the name of the game here is that that frequency has changed. But so has this level. And the idea is we want to adjust them so they match and we're just going to go back and forth, back and forth, and we want them to be within within one dB of one another. So it looks like that we're off a little bit, so we're going to adjust this one till it says 29 again, right? And it's very, very touchy. You barely touch it and it makes a big change. Okay, so, and it takes a little while to adjust. So there we go, is that one. And that top one we want about 44, correct? And you can see it kind of jumps through it. And I'm barely touching this pot, by the way. because you'll go right through that peak if you're not careful. Alright. Can't quite get it to stay up there on there, but it's close. Now we're going to go back to 333 again, and these are going to be wrong, I can almost guarantee it. And see now this one's a little bit high now. This one's kind of still where we left it. So the idea is we're going to go back and forth, back and forth until you can't tell the difference between 333 hertz <laughs> and 10 kilohertz what these outputs are. This one's a little bit closer. This one's jumping around quite a bit. This has been a problematic channel and I have a feeling we still may have a dirty potentiometer or some sort of thing going on there, but because it's kind of intermittent. But I'm going to go back and forth and keep adjusting until I get them to match. OK, 
hey, we're pretty close. This channel's still jumping around a little bit, but there's 333 hertz, and there's 10 kilohertz. And they're not moving a whole lot. This one's jumping, but again, when it stabilizes, it's pretty close within one millivolt. So I think we're okay. Okay, the chrome tape is tracking almost perfectly as well, so that's good. It fell right into place. I was kind of surprised. Okay, the next thing they have you do is we're adjusting the record level adjustment, and you're going to feed a 316 millivolt signal at 333 hertz into the record jacks. Then you're going to go to TP40 and TP41, which is right here and here, and I'll show you. Right here and here. And you're going to adjust the record level until you get 710 millivolts, which represents minus 3 dB. At that point in time, we're going to go back to our record level adjustments. And remember, we centered those roughly, so they're off. We're going to adjust those until we get the 710 millivolts out when we're recording. So what you're going to do is you're going to set it to monitor the tape, you're going to record, and then you're going to adjust until you get that minus 3 dB, which is 710 millivolts. And you can see I've adjusted the uh, normal tape, now I have it set to chrome, and they want this adjustment done with the Dolby NR turned on. This is not the Dolby adjustment yet, but this adjustment is made with Dolby turned on. So if we record, this should go up to about minus 3 dB, and you can see it does, and it should track somewhere around 710 millivolts, and it, since it's a single turn pot, if you breathe on it, it jumps a whole lot. So you can see the top one's 711, the bottom one's around 720 something, and it'll jump around a little bit, and that's just because the pot is so, so delicate and touchy. Really, all of these pots should be 10 turn pots. And if you really wanted to go crazy with this machine, that's how you would adjust it. Okay, next thing we're going to adjust is the Dolby record level. And what they're having us do is feed a 1 kilohertz signal at 316 millivolts into the record input jacks. We're set to source once again over here, and then we're going to use, we use the input line adjustment for 0 dB, which should be 1 volt. And if we look up here, we definitely have 1 volt. Now, here's the thing. We want to turn this down by 40 dB, which means we want to turn it down until just the first LED is lit up. So if I turn this down here, so we want to go minus 40 dB, somewhere around there. And what we should see is about 20 millivolts. And of course, you have a little bit of leeway with that light turning on, so it's really kind of subjective. But when I turn it down and I look at my meter, 20 millivolts, 24 millivolts, and again, I'm still not convinced that the potentiometers are totally balanced. I mean, it's an old carbon potentiometer, but let's just go through the motions. If they're not matched, it says to go in and you adjust VR301 and VR302, which are these two pots over here. And I'll show them to you. And it looks like right now we're looking at the right channel that we have to adjust. So the right channel is the one that's a little bit high, so that would be this one, which is VR302. And we're just going to go in there, and I'm just going to adjust it just the tiniest little bit, which is probably going to be a mistake, because these pots are so touchy. OK, 
Okay. I think we're going to leave well enough alone. I can't get it to come in any closer. Okay, it works a lot better when you have the Dolby turned on. <laughs> Even though the instructions tell you to turn the Dolby off. So that doesn't make much sense. But with it on, there we go. We got it adjusted, and they're both perfect. So that's, I think, a typo on that instruction there. I think they meant to turn it on, not off. Okay, the last part of this was the adjustment for the Dolby. Um, let me go back through here again. The Dolby NR playback level. And the wording of the, I mean, there's only four steps to it. But the wording is just so difficult for me to understand that I can't quite figure out what they're trying to do and I'm not going to move those pots. <laughs> I think it's working how it is. It might be out a wee little bit, but I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not a big fan of Dolby B. I just don't like it. I don't like the sound of it. I've heard very well recorded Dolby B encoded tapes and I just don't like it. <laughs> so I won't use it anyway, but eventually at some point in time I, I may revisit that. So what I did was I went ahead and I recorded uh, some YouTube safe music on a standard tape. We're going to use a standard tape. We're not even going to use Chrome on this. And I'll play it back. I'll direct connect it into the camera through the buffer amplifier so you can hear it. And it didn't turn out too bad. Now, what I will say is a pre-recorded tape, the ones that I do have, sound absolutely phenomenal. I was shocked how good this thing performs. Uh, I just didn't think you could get that kind of high frequency response out of you know one of these, but it it does it. Um, with this particular tape type, it's not the easiest thing to get the calibration to come in. The bias and level came in really easily, just a little bit uh, to the right of center. The EQ isn't quite where it needs to be, um, at least by the adjustment. And I don't know if that has something to do with an adjust with an alignment problem or what. But regardless, I think the recording came out pretty good. I don't know how it's going to play into the camera, but I'm going to record it and then. When I upload this, I'll listen to uh, hear what it sounds like. We'll all hear it together. So let me get the camera hooked up, and I'll be right back. it is all put back together. Like I said, I could probably use to go through the record alignment one more time for sure. And uh, I will eventually do that, but I'm kind of burned out on this project. And uh, the playback is fabulous, and that's really what I care about. So that's where we're going to leave it for now. As always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And until we put the next project here up on the bench, uh, I wish you all to stay well, and we'll see you again real soon. Take care. Bye-bye.